Good morning and welcome to this week's episode of the Visual Studio Office Hours. I'm your host, Matt Christensen, coming live to you from my garage in Redmond. And uh, today is a really, really interesting topic because it's one that I am really curious about, but I, and I have no idea how any of uh, any answers to the questions I'm going to ask because uh, this is about being an engineer at Microsoft. And I'm a program manager. I work with a bunch of engineers over the years, uh, but I don't actually know what it's like being an engineer and how they work, uh, sort of when you get down to the details of it. And so I'm very excited to get some answers to this, and um, there's no better person to answer, uh, answer these questions than uh, Tina from the Visual Studio team. Good morning, Tina. Good morning. Can you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yeah, so uh, my name is Tina Schrepfer. Um, I am a engineering manager at Visual Studio. Uh, I've been on the Visual Studio team for about six years. And then before that, I was uh, in the Windows engineering systems team uh, for about seven years. So I've been an individual contributor uh, engineer most of my career, uh, meaning that I don't, you know, I don't manage anybody. I'm just an engineer kind of working on, on, uh, on, uh, on issues, right? Um, writing code. Um, and uh, I've been sort of uh, moved into a manager role about 10 months ago. Uh, so I've been a manager since. Um, and I'm part of the Visual Studio platform group, uh, which means that we build the APIs for other people to um, build more features on top of Visual Studio. Uh, and specifically, my team owns the Visual Studio extensibility charter. So our goal is to improve the experience for both uh, extension developers and consumers. Awesome. So before we dive into it, uh, there's there's something there that's kind of interesting that I think maybe most people are not aware of, which is that the core Visual Studio team that builds the APIs, we don't really build a lot of the features that people are using every day. We're building the platform underneath, which other teams built upon, like the ASP.NET team, they build the, you know, the web stuff or in, you know, the WinForm stuff and the C++ stuff. But we don't really build any features on the platform team. Is that is that full? Is that accurate? I think to the most degree, right? Like my team owns like uh, things like Service Hub, right? It's an infrastructure for for components to be out of proc in Visual Studio, so we can kind of take advantage of uh, other uh, target frameworks or 64-bit um, uh, processing. Um, so there's not really like it's it's not really any feature that you would think of in Visual Studio that you interact with. Um, but our team also owns the integrated terminal, which is a feature that uh, users interact with, and it's it's part of the PAT platform. But for the most part, the platform team provides APIs. Um, so if you take editor, for example, if you think about when you're typing in the editor and that brings up completion, well, the list of uh, what's in there is provided by a language service team like Roslyn, right? Um, and we kind of just provide them with the API so that they could fill out that list and then bring up that completion session. Um, so we don't really own any and I, I think like if you think of like uh, the, the data and completion, we don't really own any of that. We just kind of own the mechanism for you to bring that up. OK, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. So yeah. <clears throat> so that's kind of interesting because we get a lot of feedback and, and questions and people go to the Visual Studio team and says, hey, my, you know, this doesn't work in WinForms or in whatever component. And we then redirect, we have to redirect that to the WinForms team because it's not a, a core Visual Studio thing. Um, so I hope I cleared that confusion up for some people that might have been wondering about that. Um, OK, Tina. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I've, you know, I've seen over the years, you know, people join teams, they move to other teams, they move around, and there's a lot of new faces uh, in the various teams that joins all the time. And, and I've always been wondering, the new engineers like that joins, let's say, your team, like what is the first thing they do? What is the thing that an engineer do when they, when they show up for the first day on your team? How do they get to the code? How do they start writing Visual Studio features or, or infrastructure pieces? Yeah, so uh, as a new engineer, uh, what you'll probably do first uh, is familiarize with our uh, Azure DevOps um, uh, repo system, right? We mainly deal with three types of repos. There's what we call a microbuild repo. Um, so if you like, as you can imagine, Visual Studio is a huge code base with many, many, many thousands of lines of code, right? Um, so before we used to have this one central repo, we, where we call the VS repo, where you know every single line of code was checked into that repo. 
Um, and the problem with that is the build time is insane, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's impossible to get anything done quickly. So over the past few years, what we've done is we moved uh, a lot of components to be outside of the VS repo. Um, and we, what we do is we build, uh, we'll build them in a micro build environment, meaning like the, the DLLs and the XCs that they produce is built in a different pipeline. Uh, and then we insert those built assemblies back into the Visual Studio uh, repo, and then that gets compiled into the Visual Studio that you would install on your machine. So most of the code these days that people write are probably in micro build repos. So a good example of that would be on my, that my team owns would be like the language server client. So language server protocol is a protocol that was developed by Visual Studio Code that uh, provides a single standardized platform for people to provide uh, language smarts uh, across platforms. So we own the Visual Studio client portion of that, and that code is in a micro build repo. Um, so it's 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 just like any repo that you would enlist on GitHub, right? You have your own um, targets. You probably set up your own way of building, but essentially you can just launch a, a developer command prompt and then you can go MS build your solution and then that, that just builds your thing. Um, and it's very easy to F5 debug. You just kind of do what you would normally do in a regular uh, solution outside of developing a Visual Studio. Um, and then there's the VS repo that I mentioned before. Um, this is a kind of a special repo where we have this thing called Razzle. Um, and Razzle is basically just a customized build environment where we insert our own uh, targets um, and command prompts with environment variables to sort of uh, customize our build environment. Um, and that's where a lot of our kind of legacy code lives. Um, so for, for example, all of our native code, right? Um, what you would see like in devon.xd or msn.dll, that goes into the VS repo. Um, and you would have to use uh, this command prompt we call Razzle to, uh, you would have to launch that in order to build any assemblies that come out of the VS repo. Um, so for most folks, uh, VS repo is mainly reserved for like native code um, writing. Uh, we do have managed code in there, but the problem with the managed code in there is that there's really no good integration with uh, Visual Studio because of the custom targets that get set up by Razzle. Uh, so the so the building of it is a little hard. Um, and then uh, it's a little bit different uh, when you work in VS uh, repo in that you can't really F5 debug, right? You can't open up a solution because you're missing the custom build targets that Razzle provides. And then you can't, you can't just say, I, I wanna debug this assembly. So what we do is a lot of people uh, actually, you know, build debug bits or, you know, sprinkle in debug.launch or debug asserts in their code when they want to debug something and then attach the debugger when their scenario is hit. Um, so it's a little bit more legacy, it's a little bit more cumbersome, but we do have a, a lot of code that's central to Visual Studio in that repo. Um, and then the third type of repo we have are GitHub repos. So um, we do like uh, a good number of our projects are open source. So Rosin is a good example of that, right? It's a huge project and it's open source. Um, so for, for people who are involved with the Rosin team, they probably primarily interact with the uh, GitHub repo um, and then uh, more of an open source community type of development. Okay, that was a lot of information there. So um, one thing, so a few things stuck out here. So one is that it's really funny that we have to put like debug a launch mm -hmm. into, into those statements that, you know, I'm an old dev web developer and it's it's sort of almost like a console write line or yeah you know it's an old school way of, of it's a debugging mechanism you know old old school style so that's kind of funny that we still do that in something as big and and fancy as as a mm -hmm. studio and so that makes me feel good when I do it in JavaScript for instance <laughs> yeah I don't feel alone I feel it's okay it's not as dirty as I thought it was yeah so that's good to know um so all of these repos so the GitHub of course, is Git, but you mentioned Azure DevOps. Um, mm -hmm. is, is, is all of it Git, or do we use any TFS or TFVS or whatever it's called nowadays? Uh, we don't use TFS anymore. Uh, all of our source code operations are Git operated. Um, I think the only place that you might encounter TFS is probably if you want to dig back into the Dev 11 or Dev 12, where the source code is managed by TFS. Um, then you have to dig a little deeper, but we, I don't recall a recent scenario where we have to do that. Okay, hang on. Dev 11, Dev 12, <laughs> what is what is that? 
It's just older versions of Visual Studio, like Visual Studio 20, uh, 2008 or um, things like that. But what is the what does it stand for? What's the why do we call it that? Oh, I think it's just a code name, right? Like uh, basically every single mi major milestone release that we have, uh, we give it a, uh, we used to have code names. I, I feel like we used to have, didn't we have Whitby or? Um, yeah. <laughs> Orcus. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I think Dev 11 is more like Dev 11, Dev 12. Um, I don't think there's actually a Dev 13. I think no, there's, there's a Dev not. 14. <laughs> yeah. um, Dev 14 is Visual Studio 2015. Yep, yep. Not very confusing yeah. at all. Yeah. So what? So, so okay. So Visual Studio 2019. What? What is that? That's the 16. So that means the 16th version of Visual Studio. Is that what yeah. it means? Yeah. Well, if you skip over 13, I don't think the math is a little because <laughs> we didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> we skipped 13. Yeah. You know, uh, I asked about that one time. Like, why do we skip 13? And I think the obvious answer that you think of is, oh, it's because superstition. The right. same reason that in hotels there's no 13th floor. Mm -hmm. Like I think my mom, she, she whenever there's 13 dinner guests, she actually puts a 14th plate out just so that there's not set for 13 people. But that turned out not to be the case. Okay. Uh, what I heard was, I wrote a blog post about this a while ago, and I had, and I was, had to talk to the people that um, was in the room when they decided to not do Dev 13 and go directly from 12 to, to 14. And it had to do with like aligning the, the numbers. So you know how Dev 12 uh, was actually Visual Studio 2013. Mm. Just like Dev 14 is Visual Studio 2015. And so if they went to 13, like Dev 13 straight after 12, then that would be off again because they would now be 2015, right? And so mm -hmm. it would be, so now there's two years apart. That wasn't good. So they decided to skip it. But now they're still a year apart, right? Right. Because now 14 came out, but that was 2015. So it was, um, I don't know exactly if it was miscommunication by the people who, who made the decision or or how that came to be exactly. But they was decided to skip it and it had nothing to do with superstition. That's interesting. So just a fun little anecdote. Yeah. Okay. So developer comes in, <clears throat> learns how to set everything up, right? But it's so far... You've described it well. They need to know Git. It seems like because mm -hmm. they need to be able to do a Git clone, or do they have to fork it? Do they have their own like what branching? How does that? How does that work? How do you do? What do you do there? Uh, so what we do uh, in uh, most of our Azure DevOps Git repos is we create a topic branch. So we we basically take a branch, either uh, the main branch or some release channel, uh, and then we we basically create a topic branch off of that. It's kind of like a fork, but um, I don't think we use fork that much within Azure DevOps. If you're working with GitHub, I think uh, the the pattern so far in the repos that I've been involved in is you do fork and then you merge uh, your fork back into the main uh, the main branch. Um, and then we do have release branches versus the you know develop branch, right? Um, uh, we operate on a three week sprint cycle, so every three weeks is a sprint. Uh, and then the last two days of the sprint, we lock the branch down, uh, the main the main develop branch, right? Uh, what what it means is any changes that you want to go through would have to go through more rigorous uh, approval process because we want to stabilize the product. So we would only we would kind of take a look at what are the changes that need to go in in those last two days, um, and then decide whether they they can be moved out to the next sprint so we have more time for stabilization, or if it's a critical fix or a critical feature that we should bring it up for upper management approval. That makes sense. Is that is that what uh, is that what they call ask mode? And and maybe explain what ask mode is and then escrow. Um. Yeah. So ask mode, there's actually two, um, two types of ask mode. There's what we call an M2 ask mode and then what we call a QB ask mode. So before I kind of talk about that, um, I want to explain the concept of QB. So QB is quarterback, right? So basically every release of Visual Studio, so uh, 16, um, uh, what, what we're, we're on like 16, 8 right now, right? Preview 1, preview 2, preview 3. The entire 16.x release is managed by a person uh, whom we call quarterback. Uh, 
Um, and the quarterback is kind of responsible for reviewing all of the features that are planned for going into that milestone um, and then coordinating the, uh, the the release as well as figuring out, OK, uh, when we get into the stabilization mode, if we have critical fixes or uh, critical regressions, what needs to be fixed, um, absolutely fixed? So that's that's kind of how we manage our release cycle. So. Um, Back to the sort of two types of ask modes. So the last two days, uh, the branch is locked and we go through what we called an M2 ask mode. M2 just means it's, it has to be a, approved by a group engineering manager. So a group engineer, engineering manager um, essentially means they manage other managers, right? They don't manage engineers directly. So they're in, in charge of an engineering group. Um, so what we do is whenever you want to submit code, you would you would basically send this email um, to your lead first and then the lead forwards it on to uh, the M2. Um, and uh, we kind of talk about, OK, what is this code change? Uh, what validation was done? What scenario does it fix? And where's the PR? Um, so we can do a more rigorous review. So after the two days is done, we go into an even more strict stabilization phase where now if we have anything that needs to that, that needs to go on that train for the release, it needs to go through quarterback approval. So it just means like we have more documentation that we have to do. We have more rigorous uh, testing that we're requiring um, and more hoops to jump through. Does this um, so I could see how like if you if you find a bug and you say I definitely want this bug fixed before uh, the next update to Visual Studio goes out, um, then that might be approved by you know the M2. To, mm -hmm. I think M2 stands for manager level two or something, right? Anyway, <laughs> um, and so it has to be approved by them and then uh, the quarterback as well. And see, that makes sense from a from a quality perspective. You don't want something that will crash Visual Studio, and so you want high quality. So you want to fix those important bugs. And so you want to take them up to ask the quarterback, can we, can we get this through um, for the next release? But what about if it's like features or tweaks to features? Can any get so important that they will also go through and be approved by the quarterback, let's say? Um, it kind of depends. We have, uh, uh, you know, certain tenants, right? Accessibility is a tenant that we really care about. So let's say you implemented a feature and it was discovered last minute that, um, by the way, this this button is not accessible. accessible. So we have to, it, it's not really a bug because that feature is not released yet, but it's part of you know, improving, tweaking that feature. So for issues like this, where it's an in, in te, important tenant to, to sign off, um, those can be submitted. Uh, what we don't want to do is we, we don't want to introduce a completely new feature you know, two days before we ship um, and then discover you know, 10, 20 bugs associated with that feature that we didn't have time to stabilize. Um, so those are kind of the scenarios that we want to prevent. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so there's a little bit of flexibility depending on on its priority, and it could be could be any type of fix, tweak, or yeah. whatever. Okay. Um, okay. So now now the engineer has gotten their the code down to their machine. They know how to do the branching and all this sort of stuff. Are there any other tools that they use to to open the solution, and is it just a solution in Visual Studio, just like anyone else using Visual Studio? You have solutions with with projects like .NET projects, I assume, or .NET Core even sometimes? Um, or, or, or do you have to use other tools, command line tools? Like what's the what's this next step there for the engineer? Well, I, I think uh, uh, we should talk a little bit about the types of uh, work that engineers do, right? Um, most of the time, if you're doing feature development, it's uh, looking at uh, solutions. Right, and then uh, working through solutions and projects like uh, as you would normally do in a non in a in a project that doesn't build Visual Studio, right? Like if you're build, building a website or if you're building a, a Windows app, it, it would be the same thing. Um, for but in terms of the types of work that engineers do, there's bugs, um, there's feature development, and then what and then what we have uh, what we call house cleaning, right? Bugs are uh, just issues that come through from various channels. So uh, one of the most um, uh, one of the most, most common bugs that I think a lot of people dread on the team are Watsons. Um, and what Watsons are are, are basically uh, crashes that get reported through the Windows error reporting system. So anytime as a customer where you have Visual Studio just kind of die unexpectedly or 
crash, um, uh, the, the we will record that through the Windows error reporting system where we would uh, kind of take a look at your, your stack of the crash and then we, it would also upload a memory dump. Um, sometimes a memory dump is like a mini dump, um, sometimes it's a full heap dump. Um, the difference between a mini dump and a heap dump is just how much information you have. Um, for, so a full deep heap dump would have a lot more information for you to go debug um, versus a mini dump. So for, for those, uh, what people usually do is um, those get reported and then we have a centralized kind of um, uh, data insights team that uh, takes, takes a look at those and then log bugs against the really critical ones. So we'll, uh, the system will report how many hits we have, what's the percentage of hits um, and how urgent this is and then kind of create bugs accordingly. So what's a hit? A hit means uh, at any time a user encounter this, that's a hit. Right. Um, oh, so when they, when they have this, when the same uh, uh, reason for the crash happened, not any crash, but like that specific crash, like that was caused by the specific call stack. Yep. Yep. So anytime you have a crash, uh, the Windows and uh, error reporting system will take a look at the cause of the uh, of the crash. Right. It will take basically take a look at the the stack trace that was. Uh, resulting in, in, in that exception. And then it will bucketize. So similar stack traces will get bucketized into the same category. And then every time you hit a similar bucket is basically another hit on that bucket. Okay. So some of these have like, I, I assume just a single hit. And some yeah. of these Watson bucks will have thousands maybe? Yep. And yep. then do we, do we fix them all? Or do we, we start with the one that has a thousand and then eventually we'll get to the one that has one hit or... Is there a limit to what we kind of go for and fix? Uh, I, I don't think we fix them all. Um, what we prioritize the most are the top crashes. So for a given for a given release, let's say the 16.6 release or the 16.7 release, we have uh, people like the quarterback of that release, for example, right, constantly monitoring what are the top crashes for this release, um, and then we would log bugs uh, against those uh, those crashes and then get engineers to fix them. So we're constantly monitoring telemetry and uh, Windows error reporting and then fixing the most critical ones, the, the most uh, egregious ones. So, and, th and those fixes are the ones that go out into the, um, uh, we have these service releases. So after each each new update to Visual Studio, let's say, I think the latest uh, released version was 16.6. And so then you have 16.6.1.2.3 and those are service releases. and Typically, they will co contain like critical bug fixes. Is that right? Like the Watson crash yep. fixes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So they'll include Watsons. They'll probably include what we call perf Watsons. So perf Watsons are, are not crashes, but they're hangs or UI delays. So uh, anytime that you see Visual Studio kind of freeze up for a little bit, like even uh, a second, um, I think uh, there's a threshold that we, we monitor whether that counts as a UI delay or a hang, right? Um, so anytime that happens, we have our telemetry system also logging information. So we also look at those that type of data to see uh, how responsive Visual Studio is. Um, and uh, for the Watsons, what engineers typically do is they open up uh, the, the memory dumps in WinDBG and then debug the, the kind of root cause that way. For perf Watsons, what we do is we collect ETL traces, um, which is uh, kind of like um, data markers in the code where we measure performance. Uh, and then we use what we uh, a tool called PerfView to look at the ETL traces and then determine, okay, well, for this delay that happened at this time, time what, what was, the, what was the, the system doing? What are some of the call stacks that are in the system and why it's, it's causing that? Yeah, so we're basically just using the Windows, the built-in PerfView in, in Windows for handling yeah. that. Okay, so that's actually really cool. And that maybe also explain why. So I looked at the numbers, right? Um, with something that we follow, like the number of hangs over the years have gone down significantly and the number of crashes has gone down significantly. I'm, I'm sure that people watching this are like, oh, it happens to me all the time. And that's probably true. But generally speaking, it's gone down significantly. And so, um, so that's based on the Watson and also the telemetry. So when people are sending us telemetry, we actually are able to fix and improve the product based on what they send us. That's yeah. a, that's a, that's very good to know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I think you've explained um, 
about how we're doing uh, a bunch of this stuff. Um, um, and so you were explaining about the, the different types of work items that the engineer had, and you, you got around to doing bugs. And what, was there was there another one? Was there are there other things they do? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so there's feature development, right? Like uh, we we can fix bugs until you know and and the end of time. I, I I think the no piece of software is bug free. So we can find as many bugs as we want and fix as many bugs as we want. But at the same time, we also need to move the product forward, and that's what we call feature development. Uh, so for for us, uh, since we are on the platform team, we're basically providing APIs for our partners, both internal and external, mostly internal. Uh, what feature development for us essentially means we're developing APIs, um, infrastructure for people to use. So it kind of starts with we know we have this gap in in the product, like for example. Um, uh, we know we wanted to move uh, some of the components to be out of proc a few years ago. So we started this uh, platform feature called Service Hub. Um, so we could start with an idea first of what's, what's missing in the platform, um, either it's Service Hub or Language Server Protocol, and then we kind of talk about it. We communicate with our partners to see what exactly is it that they need, um, and then we come back and we do a spec. So what's a, part what's a partner here in this context? A partner is whoever would be using that piece of infrastructure. So it could so, be another team on in the yeah division. other team on the on on the division like uh, developer division right. Um, so for uh, service hub, it, it would mean either language services or um, you know like test explorer right. Those would be other teams that would need to use service hub. For language server protocol, it would probably be uh, uh, other language services, like for example, Roslyn. Do you want to? Would you want to potentially use LSP um, as a mechanism for providing language smarts? Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of the who the partners are depends on uh, what the feature is. Um, but we would we would talk with the partners first, um, set up a communication channel, and then once we figured out approximately of what we want to build. We want to go write a spec, a specification, a, basically a document outlining what is it that you're trying to achieve and how on a high level uh, you want to go uh, uh, build it. Um, and then we would, uh, most of the time we would have a spec review. Um, it kind of depends on how big the feature is, right? If you're adding a new, let, let's say the terminal, right? Like we're currently working some, on some features for the terminal where, uh, you know, just more niceties of like integrating, integrating the terminal further into Visual Studio, like maybe into Solution Explorer or uh, supporting some of the niceties. Like for those type of features where we call more like bug level features, uh, we probably don't do a spec and we don't do a spec review because they're just so small. But for big things like um, we want to support uh, a new target framework for uh, Service Hub, or we want to, you know, like expand on some of the major infrastructure for LSP, what we would do is we would write a spec and then we would have a spec review with the um, kind of stakeholders, what we call stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So whoever's interested in consuming the platform and using it would be part of the spec review. And these would uh, be other engineers from around the the orc? Yeah, mostly engineers. Mostly yeah. engineers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then after that, we would go into the implementation phase, right? So the spec would offer a general architecture, right? Um, of these are the components I want to build, and this is how I want to structure things, but it won't go into detail of these are the, you know, the five or 10 classes I'm going to write. Um, and how I'm going, going to write that. So that's more on implementation. Um, and the implementation, and I think spec can kind of uh, interchange in, in the order of where we do things, because a lot of times you can't really do a spec without going into the code first, right? You can't, like, you, you kind of have to write the code and then get an idea of how it's going to work before you can confirm whether this works or not. So what we, uh, what we also have is what we call spikes, um, which are essentially prototypes. So, for example, if I want to build a um, uh, a new feature, I, I don't have a clear idea of how I'm going to build it yet. I'm first going to prototype it, um, just write maybe hacky code, maybe throwaway code, um, but not very clean, not very production level code, just to make it work, right? And then after that, I would get an idea of, okay, this works or did this didn't, um, and then I would write my spec based on that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the coding and the spec writing is it's more about uh, making sure that you have an idea and then communicating that idea and then finally implementing the idea to production level quality uh, so that it's stabilized. Right. So there's there's a, a huge level of, of course, coding when you're a software engineer. Right. Uh, but there's also sort of the process aspect of, of getting it reviewed, writing down spec for it on right. in, in wor- a work document, I take it. Yeah. Um, sharing that out, facilitating the meeting. So you you get to learn a lot of other skills that maybe you didn't get in college or wherever, wherever yeah. you came from. So mm-hmm. maybe it's a little broader. You don't just get an office and, and are, are put in the corner and, and told to code, which is kind of nice. Yeah, you can actually see from my background. It's my uh, I'm working from home right now, as is with anybody. But this is this background is actually what my office looks like. So we have a team room. Um, we have engineers in the team room. Uh, we don't have uh, single offices anymore, at least for Visual Studio. Uh, but yeah, this is what what it looks like when we someday get back get to go back to work. I was just about to say almost right because all the monitors are gone. People have been taken home to their home offices. All their equipment except yeah. for there's a few monitors behind you there. So you took this photo like w- after people had left and stayed home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And right behind you, that's my old desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's sitting there now? Uh, nobody. <laughs> okay. In honor of my memory, of my yeah. legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so so the most teams in uh, in building 18, which is where the Visual Studio uh, team is, um, work in open offices. I think the all of them work in open offices, just like um, what you see in Tina's background there. Um, okay, so a lot of it is like okay, they're the engineer is getting a task, so they get a ticket from Azure DevOps, which is where we keep all our work items and our bugs and everything, right? So they they get a, a task assigned to them. And they might start coding immediately because they need to investigate something or it's a spike. Um, and so let's just take the terminal as a as a feature area. So that project is it. So the terminal is inside Visual Studio. We're not just so everyone is on the same page here. Uh, a couple of releases ago, we introduced a, a built-in terminal, like a console, basically, inside Visual Studio. Uh, it's been a, a thing that people have been asking us to do for years, and it finally came in and it uses the Windows, the new Windows terminal under the hood. So we kind of had to wait for that uh, to make it really good, and that was part of why it took a while. But it's there, and that's its own feature. It's it's an example of where we're not just providing the infrastructure pieces, but we're actually providing a feature to Visual Studio. And um, and I would imagine that because it interfaces with the new Windows terminal, and all this, it does all sorts of things that it's a relatively large uh, project or solution. So how does that actually, if you explain how is it laid out, is there an SLN file, a solution file that contains .NET projects? Is, is it, or what? Uh, I think the, t- uh, the terminal is, a, is very interesting because I think it, it contains both native and managed code. Um, so, what the Windows terminal, I believe, is actually a native project. Um, and what we do is we rehost the Windows terminal within Visual Studio. Uh, and the Visual Studio shell is actually a WPF project, so it's managed, right? So, we're basically hosting a native, um, uh, a native uh, a UI piece inside a managed framework. Uh, so, there's little bits uh, here and there. So. Most of what you see when you interact with a, a, a terminal in Visual Studio is probably comes from the Windows terminal itself. So, for example, if you see um, uh, issues with uh, localization, for example, right? Like um, I'm trying to type, I'm trying to copy and paste some Chinese characters into the terminal, and hey, when I paste it, it's not what I expect. It's a bunch of weird Unicode um, uh, characters that I didn't expect to see. Um, that's actually uh, probably part of whatever shell that's hosting that uh, that 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 UI piece under underneath. Um, so we don't own that part, right? So depending on what you do, whether it's a developer command prompt or PowerShell, that kind of routes to them. Um, and then the the and then the piece on top is sort of the uh, Windows terminal uh, that we rehost. So for that, I think it's a little bit uh, different because you don't really have a 
a solution that you could open in Visual Studio that say, hey, this is the uh, Visual Studio terminal because we re we rehost um, and the code is kind of distributed across both our team for the rehosting part of it and then the Windows team for the actual meat uh, of it. And then probably the PowerShell team or the command team for you know some of the, the shell command processing part of it. Okay, so it's a bunch of different projects containing different types of code that all compile together to make a single feature. Uh, it's not even compiled. So like when we get the Windows terminal, it, we we don't get code from them. Like we don't rebuild their code, right? We get assemblies from them. We get NuGet packages from them that we reship. Um, so that's how that works. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. So maybe that was a bad example because that seems like it's a special case. So I'm just trying to get a feel for like what it is when you sit in Visual Studio and you have you look at your Solution Explorer when you're working on one of the maybe one of the newer feature areas. Uh, like, what does that look like? Is it just solution containing a bunch of projects? Do we keep hierarchies of projects in folders? Like, what does it what does it actually feel like? Is it is it just like any other solution in Visual Studio, or do we? Because we're like the thing that's interesting is when you're building Visual Studio using Visual Studio. Like, is that a different development practice? Like, when you hit F5, what happens? Like normally it's a web page that opens up our console window, but when you're working on Visual Studio using Visual Studio, what does that even look like? Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, great aspects of Visual Studio is pretty much everything in Visual Studio can be an extension. So uh, pretty much everything that we do to build Visual Studio and an extension developer can, can, can do as well. Um, so our workflow is very similar uh, for extension developers who, who, who write tools for, for Visual Studio. So I'll take an example of uh, language server protocol. So the code base uh, that we write to support the um, LSB protocol in Visual Studio is a solution. Um, and we have various projects uh, uh, in it. Um, and the most important one uh, that you would use to debug or or build is probably what we call like a container object, uh, sorry, container project. Uh, what that is is it's essentially a it's a V6 project, it's an extension project. Um, so it's a, a special flavor of the traditional CS project that you would see when you're developing um, console apps or or libraries. Um, and what that does when you F5 on that V6 project is it would open a a a new instance of Visual Studio, what we call the experimental hive. Um, it's basically an isolated instance of Visual Studio away from your main develop uh, scenario. And your extensions get, uh, your uh, assemblies get loaded into that um, instance of Visual Studio and you could put debug breakpoints and kind of kind of hit different things there. Um, so a lot of a lot of people on our team do F5 debug, right? Like you basically launch Visual Studio, the debugger gets attached immediately. And whatever you, you breakpoint you, you you put on uh, uh, in your code gets activated when that scenario is hit. Um, what other people also do is, let's say I don't want to uh, start my experimental instance uh, immediately with F5 debug because um, I would need to download a lot of symbols. Maybe, like maybe my bandwidth connection is really low. Like maybe I just don't care about all of the other scenarios of startup. I just want to focus on on my um, particular scenario. So what you could do is you could start the experimental instance without debugger attached, and then when you get to a place where you want to attach, you would you would use uh, the debugger and attach yourself. Right, that's also another option. Mm -hmm. And so it's important here to just to remind people that the experimental instance is not a separate thing of Visual Studio. It is Visual Studio, where you just pass a specific command line flag to it. And uh, so if, if you have Visual Studio, you also have the experimental instance. Just right. to make that clear. There's, there's nothing special that we do there to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, this seems pretty straightforward. This doesn't seem like it's a different type of setup from, let's say, other companies. That's pretty standard type stuff. You need to know your source control, I guess, or you will learn it when you start. Yeah. And you know, solutions and projects and debugging is sounds very similar to any other net project so that's that's very cool that's good to know i always kind of found it a little bit scary to think about oh 
because I used to be a developer and I was like, could I be a developer at Microsoft? I always thought that was too complicated. Like that's, uh, but maybe it's not, maybe it's kind of just similar to what we may already know. So that's, uh, that's kind of nice. I like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, okay, so now you got a job. You've been there for a while. You're getting really good at it. Um, maybe you feel like you want a promotion. I mean, how does that work? Uh, so promotions, uh, we we have what we call bands at Microsoft, right? You're, you're either in sort of like the entry level band or you're in the mid career level band or you're in senior and above band. Um, and usually what promotion means is it's, it's, kind of uh, um, giving you credit for what you've achieved uh, throughout the past uh, few years or uh, whatever time period that is. But it's really about, are you able to take on more challenging products, right? Um, it's it's more about, because the problems that you face as an engineer kind of becomes bigger and more vague and more complex the, uh, the higher you go in level. So for, uh, uh, you know, for an engineer, out of college and kind of just starting in the work uh, workplace, what uh, the type of work that the engineer might do might be very scoped. Like, you know, we need a button in Visual Studio that does X and it's very um, well spelled out um, and the code involved is probably more simple, right? And then you move in, you, you do that for a while and you prove that you can do that and you can take on a little bit more complex things. So then we promote you into kind of the mid-career uh, level stuff. And the mid-career level is more like, I can really independently do something, right? I don't really need that much handholding anymore. If I give you a task, um, uh, I can I can figure out who are the right people to talk to. I can figure out what's the general architecture. Uh, maybe not myself, but you know, at least elicit feedback from other people, and then go implement that, and then make sure it's of high quality and uh, I have sufficient testing and it's stabilized, right? So then you do that for a little bit and then you just kind of move on to bigger and bigger problems. Like when you get to the senior and principal level bands, um, it's more about like, we kind of know we have a problem here somewhere. Like we don't know exactly, go figure out as an engineer, what are what's the exact issue that's facing us and then come up with a solution. Um, and then if you, if you move even more, it's more about like, okay, what what are the problems here? Like, let me find out what are the problems that, that need to solve and then I can either formulate a plan and solve it myself, or I can elicit, you know, the help of more junior developers to go help me solve this problem that I found. So I think promotion is more of a, a sort of a way to say I'm able to handle more and I'm able to handle uh, things that are more complex. Right. So if you, so the entry, so if you're coming out of college, you come into that entry level band. Uh, but if you're if you're coming from an industry from another company or something like that, you can you can come in at a higher level. You can come straight into senior band or even higher, maybe principal or yep. or something like that. But then the same thing applies. You're then expected to be able to handle those larger, more complicated things. Is that right? Yep, exactly. Okay. So, you know, at some point, a lot of people they and actually a lot of people don't, but some people might I say, they also think well. Maybe I want to try to become a manager, and you know you're a manager, mm -hmm. so I know this is going to be you know there's going to be a lot of different answers depending on who you ask. But in but if I ask you from like your perspective, your experience, what you've observed in the in your years at Microsoft, like how does that how do you go from being an individual contributor like a regular developer, let's say, and you move up the hierarchy and then you move to manager. Do you, can you become a manager like early on before you move up the hierarchy, for instance, if that's what you really want or how is that progression? That's interesting because I think over the years that I've been at Microsoft or seeing multiple, you know, versions of this, right? For, I'll just take myself uh, as an example because I, I don't think I have insights into how other people got into their manager roles. But for me, um, I, it was never, uh, I, I never really wanted to become a manager as my true, like that's my that's my goal of what I wanted to do. Um, I think it's more of like, it kind of naturally fell onto my lap and this opportunity existed and it felt like I was, you know, in the right place at the right time and hey, why not try something new? Um, but what I've observed is uh, I, I, I really wanted to become a good engineer first because uh, before I become a manager. 
Um, because I think in order for you to understand what engineers are going through and what are some of the problems they have and, you know, even to approximate like, OK, well, this task could take about this long or um, you're blocked on this because I think you need this type of help. I think I think I really needed that foundation of, be, uh, of being a really good engineer. Um, but I think there are other people uh, in the company that are uh, that are more oriented towards a management. Uh, job, right? Like maybe that fits their personality more. Maybe that that's sort of the career that they want. So they have uh, ways to sort of help them get there. Uh, so, for example, within Visual Studio, within the, the developer uh, division, uh, we have what we call culture clubs. It's basically um, uh, you know people who share an interest, whether that's like a mom's group or an LGBT uh, a LGBT group. Um, and then we also have a group called aspiring managers. So what we what that group does is for people who are uh, interested in eventually becoming a manager, they kind of um, get insights from existing managers um, on what that life is like and what helped them become successful when they transition to that role. So I think it's more it's more personal. Uh, there's really no you know one size fits all solution uh, for people who are interested. But yeah. Okay, so don't you think that that's potentially also not dangerous but um like if you if you take the like in your case like you became a really really good engineer that knew everything about your space and now you become a manager so you basically take the best developer out of being an engineer and put them in the manager seat where i guess you had little experience at the time you started um doesn't that just then productivity drops and are is that a, is that the right way of doing it um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think as a manager myself, I'm able to make more impact by helping other people kind of learn what I know myself. Right. It's more about I feel like my impact as a manager is actually broader than when I was in uh, what then when I was an IC, because as an IC, you just kind of um, code and then you you kind of come up with solutions yourself. But since I became a manager and I've had the time and it's my mission and my, my, and my job's goal to kind of mentor people and then coach them, um, I'm able to kind of uh, uh, teach them to do what I used to do. So now before it was me working on uh, one project, right? But now I can kind of uh, translate that knowledge into two or three different engineers that, that are starting out. Um, so I think that that aspect of it is amplified. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. That's uh, that's really cool. So it's kind of the opposite of than what I was uh, suggesting in my somewhat leading question. Um, so we got um, a question here from and someone that's anonymous. He says, "Will we ever see a 64-bit Visual Studio?" So we actually did an episode of The Office Hours a couple of weeks ago with uh, Andrew Arnett. So go ahead, go back and check that out. I think it's called Inner Workings of Visual Studio. Uh, he has a very good explanation of how it all works, where we are with that, and so on. So go check that out. I won't uh, talk about it here. It's a very complicated thing. Uh, Matthew asks, do you build Visual Studio in Azure pipelines yet? And how long does it take? We do. So uh, that question kind of... Um, yeah, so since we switched to the uh, micro build solution where uh, a lot of our components are built outside of the VS repo, right? It's more of a parallelized uh, build process. So for example, uh, Roslyn gets built within their own pipeline in, in GitHub. And then our components like LSP or Terminal, for example, uh, gets built within our own micro repos. So depending on the size of the individual repos itself, the build can take anywhere from you know an hour to two hours. Um, and then, uh, what, and then we have the the build of the main VS repo, and I think that takes um, I can't remember the exact time. I, I want to say at least a few hours to build. Um, so it, it's a lot faster than it, it was before. We have CI builds, uh, continuous continuous integration builds coming out of the VS repo. Uh, I think every at least what, 10, 10 builds a day. Like at least, every few hours, we'll get a, another CI build every day. Um, from the branch that you're you're currently working on, uh, and those CI builds are actual you know installs that you could you could put on your machine, um, so they're not like binaries that you would have to patch. Like that's the one I got installed, right? I have our master build, which is updated like I don't even know how many times a day. I get a notification, yeah. like every time I open Visual Studio, I get a notification that there's an update, and so that is the when the full Visual Studio repo has run its integration tests and its full build yeah. and all that sort of stuff. The output of that is a fully installable 
version of VS. Um, and and we actually used that to dog food to find issues early uh, on the team. Yeah. And I got one of those. So that's kind of cool. So, okay, so all these different micro builds. So each team has a micro build, but all, of course, only the components that you are working on is being built. So if you if there's something you haven't worked on for six months, that's not being built. And so, but what about when you do the Visual Studio, the VS repo, the big, uh, the big build? Will that still then call and build those little micro builds, or is that all? It just grabs the the build artifacts from already run builds of those micro builds. Like how does how does it stitch it all together to create one installable Visual Studio? Yeah, so I think that's exactly what it does. It's basically built, uh, grabs the artifacts of all the other micro builds. Um, that's basically the artifacts get uh, get pushed to a uh, to a cloud storage somewhere, um, and then when you build VS Repo and you and you compile that setup package for you the installer, it basically graphs the location of all those uh, inserted bits um, and then downloads them and installs them on your machine. Mm -hmm. um, what's cool about that is, let's say uh, I want to work on a feature in, uh, uh, in Terminal um, and that's from a separate repo. Or let's say I want to make a change to the editor, right? I want to I want to change the find and files uh, look and feel a little bit, like uh, maybe I want to make the button pink. Um, what I could do is I could make that change in my micro build. I would uh, uh, kind of a kick off a Azure release pipeline that would uh, build the artifact and then in insert it, uh, upload it to a cloud storage. And then I would insert that into the VS repo. Um, and before I even merge my, my PR to say, hey, this thing has been inserted and now in the product checked in, um, our engineering system actually produces a PR build that you could install. So it's, it's, it's basically a full on Visual Studio installer based on that that single Git commit that you have um, potentially going in. Wow. So this makes buddy testing, um, test sign off really easy. Um, and it gives us the ability uh, to um, test before we, we, we check in. Um, so for a lot of our changes on the platform, like let's say we have a platform change and then we also require Rosin to make a change. We could, what we could do is we could kind of uh, coordinate an insertion into a single uh, PR, and then we could have our testers test that kind of PR build before we even check it in to find issues faster um, and to make sure we don't break dog fooding scenarios for our internal uh, uh, members who are kind of using the latest master build. So every single PR produce like kicks off a new build of the whole VS repo, like the entire thing. Yeah. So I assume we would get, we have like hundreds of PRs per day. Mm -hmm. So we have a server farm, I take it, that can, yeah. that can handle this because we have to build all this in parallel because you, you said it takes like several hours to do a full build. Uh, I don't actually think the PR build is that. I, I think they did some optimization. I think the longest uh, period duration for PRs is actually running test. So once we run our uh, full, what we call DD RIT, um, it's basically like a set of tests um, that like a set of maybe 10 scenarios that we want to run through, like to make sure, hey, I can open a c -sharp solution. I can uh, start editing. I have IntelliSense. I can bring up the debugger. Those core scenarios that we want to test, once those tests are run, you have a full build. And then what we also do as part of PR is we run regression tests, um, like a performance regression tests. So we we measure UI delays and we measure hangs and uh, of the key scenarios. So if you if you want an installable build, I think you can actually get that within an hour or two because it, it, that's how long it takes for the DD RIT to t uh, run a test to, to complete. The regression take, tests take a little bit longer, and I think. Um, when I looked at it last, it was like six hours or something, or potentially. Uh, but I think they did some optimization recently to you know, decrease the, the 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 amount of time there too. Okay. So we got a question here uh, from uh, Stephen. Can you explain buddy testing? You were mentioning it earlier. Oh, buddy testing. Um, it means. Uh, Let's say I develop a new feature, right? Uh, I am working on the editor team um, and I implementing a new feature called search, like VS search. That was actually implementing a, a long time, a, a while ago. Um, and uh, I don't really want to check it in yet. I kind of just want to give, uh, uh, you know, my partners like C++ or Rosin team to try it out um, before I check it in because I'm a little bit wary of um, uh, breaking a core scenario. 
So what I could do is I could kind of stage the, the release and the builds and then do a mock insertion into the VS repo and then produce this installable uh, um, link or basically this installable executable that we could go have our testers install on a VM or on a test machine or something and then try out our test scenarios on that specific build. So it's not something that you would check in, but it's more of a, um, a, a thing that you would, you would use to test to make sure that, that what we wrote is ready for check-in. Yeah, it's, I've heard it described uh, and on a previous team, I was like as a sort of a sanity test, just making yeah. sure there's not anything obviously bad or wrong or inconvenient or something like that. Yeah. Here's another question. <clears throat> this, I guess, is a little bit back to when you were talking about Service Hub which is a, a way that we can pull, you know, pro, you know, things out of Visual Studio and out of process to run inside a service hub instead. Uh, here it goes. Uh, why did companies like JetBrains have to outsource part of their components in their extension uh, to an external process in terms of performance? What's the obvious problem from an architectural standpoint of VS? So why do we do this? Why, is, why do we even want to run code out of proc? Uh, I think there are, uh, for me, I think there are two major reasons that that we do that today. One is Visual Studio is a 32-bit process, and so the the memory footprint you have here is limited. Uh, the second reason is uh, really reliability. Like, let's say if you if I'm writing a component that's run within the same process of Visual Studio, and I have a very nasty bug there that basically just throws a fatal exception um, whenever bad things happen and that crashes the system. Um, if you're with, if you're, if you're run in proc, it just means Visual Studio just dies uh, and you lose all your work. If you move that component to be out of proc um, and you hit that same bug, it just means that that out of proc component is killed. But you could, you know, you might have, you might not have some of the um, features that were once available, like code lens, for example. Maybe, maybe you'll lose all your code lens when this, when this bug is hit. But you still have the editor loaded. You still have your unsafe changes. You can go and kind of do your cleanup, relaunch the machine in a better um, situation. Yeah, if you, if you you could even restart that service up, right? So if there was a crash in a component that runs, the code that you have in your extension that runs inside Visual Studio can respawn that service hub and continue yeah. the work in case something bad happens. So it can recover itself. Yeah, it wasn't possible before. And as you mentioned, that process can also be 64-bit. Exactly. And we, yeah, exactly. we already have a bunch of 64 bits processes just to that uh, question earlier about 64 bit. We're already we already have a bunch of 64 bit, uh, even though Visual Studio itself is not 64 bit. OK. Uh, so what other testing are you doing before you can say that a, a, a fix was was correctly solving the bug or or a feature is, is well implemented? Like how do you test your code? So we have uh, three types of tests. We have unit test, um, which I think most engineers know is just uh, kind of testing at the code level, right? Testing a method, testing a class, test testing a property. And then we have what we call integration test. Um, and in Visual Studio, we have this uh, framework called Apex. Um, and Apex is just a way for people to write um, uh, UI automation integration tests that get run as part of uh, a code uh, as, as part of a PR merge or locally. Um, and then on top of that, we also have manual test suites uh, for our CTI team to run. CTI just means um, it's a it's a team of testers that we have offshore um, and they kind of work um, uh, over the night um, to run our manual test suite and then uh, report to us if there are any issues found. So I think there are a lot of gate checks along the way, but of course, you know, uh, we, we can't possibly test everything. So we rely on a lot of community feedback. Mm -hmm. So for example, anytime that you log uh, an issue, like you use report an issue in Visual Studio and say, hey, this thing is not working. Like, um, uh, let's say, I'll give an example of uh, Toolbox, right? I get quite a few of those. Um, so let, let's say I, I, I launch Toolbox and there's nothing in there. There's no control. Um, so I go to report an issue and I say, I can't see my controls and toolbox. Hey, what's going on? Those feedback tickets, those are what we call feedback tickets. Those eventually get routed to the individual teams who own that feature. 
Um, and then we also we either have our um, we, we have a team of people kind of responding for each feature, uh, either asking for more information or creating bugs um, to track them or then or then just telling the customer like, hey, what you're doing is probably not a valid workflow and here's how you should be using the product. So we do take customer feedback very seriously. Um, it's a good way for us to, t uh, to sort of measure the health of our of our system that we built. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 another way. You know, I think we should do a full episode just on on um, report a problem and suggest a feature and how that all works. That would be super interesting um, because it does go straight to the engineers. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people don't believe that, but it does. It goes into it ends up in that when you create a ticket like a couple of minutes later, it shows up in Azure DevOps for that in, you know, with that team. Yep. All right. We are at an end. It's 10 o'clock here local time, so we've been at it for an hour and um, that's all the time we've got for today. So Tina, thank you so much for coming on and help me understand how this all works. Thank you. All right, and for the rest, to the rest of you, I hope to see you again uh, next week. And in the weeks to follow, as usual, we're doing this on Thursdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And, uh, you know, have a great day, everybody, and see you next week. <laughs>